Hello everyone and welcome back to Introduction to Ethics. In this video, we're going to be looking at some of the arguments for and against the permissibility of abortion. The first article that we're going to examine is John Noonan's article, An Absolute Value in History, An Almost Absolute Value in History, excuse me. So in this article, Noonan highlights the difficulty of determining what makes someone human and another thing not human. So when we start doing this conceptual analysis of what makes someone human versus non-human, we inevitably leave out people that we shouldn't. And one of the most marked ways in which this shows up um, is, which is when um, thinking about maybe even social distinctions. So Noonan uses the example of racism. So if we think that what it means to be a human is a socially constructed concept, what everybody recognizes as what it means to be human, then invariably that can justify racism. And we don't want a definition of what constitutes humans that could leave us open to something like racism, especially when we're thinking about ethics. So if you've got a majority of people who thinks that what it means to be human is or a person is your skin color, that means you can start ruling people out based on they're not having the same skin color as you. So Noonan argues that instead of making conceptual distinctions, we need something more solid to grab onto in order to figure out what makes a, someone a human. So he thinks that we should look at statistical probabilities. And the example that he uses is um, the viability of um, the different stages of basically um, the, I, the different stages of, I don't wanna use the word life because that would assume too much against someone who is pro-abortion. So let's see. So instead of trying to um, look at these conceptual distinctions, we should be looking at probabilities. And he notes that there's a marked difference between the probability of the survival of the individual sex organs, so like the sperm and the ovum, versus when they come together and they, uh, at conception, and could lead to um, a fully developed fetus or could lead to a fetus. So based on the differences in probability of survival between the sperm and versus a zygote or that moment of conception, what comes together, um, Newton thinks that um, looking at these different probabilities, um, the jump in the possibility for survival means that uh, we do have some moral obligations to something like a zygote that could survive and become a human um, versus something like a sperm or an ovum that doesn't have a um, as great a chance of surviving. It seems like intuitively we would have more obligations, if any, to something like a zygote, an embryo, or a fetus than we do to just the sperm and the ovum. But that's just the beginning of the argument that Noonan puts forth. So there's this kind of like um, argument from probabilities, right? So the more probable it is that something survives, the more likely it is that we have some sort of obligation to it. But Noonan thinks we could do more than this. Noonan thinks that because a zygote has a complete set of DNA at conception, that life begins at conception. Um, so what he thinks gives a fetus moral status, what gives it human rights and puts it in the moral community is its possession of human DNA. So what Noonan um, says here is that um, because that zygote has all that's needed to become human, then life begins at conception and at conception it has the full rights and privileges of a member of the moral community. So what Noonan thinks that this implies is that when we're thinking about abortion, the rights of both the fetus and the mother matter equally. So a fetus is a member of the moral community and has a right to life just like the mother. And so what Noonan ultimately thinks 
um, is the result of his argument is that abortion is wrong in all cases except for self-defense. So when the mother's uh, life is in danger, basically. So this is um, what John Noonan, this is John Noonan's argument. And so um, he would fall more into the pro-life camp. So abortion is only permissible in the case of the mother's life being threatened. Okay. Next is Judith Jarvis Thompson's article, A Defense of Abortion. Thompson's work is unique because she's a pro-choice philosopher who grants that the fetus is a person. So something that can be a sticking point for the abortion debate, if you'll recall from the last video, is does the fetus count as a person, right? This is the question that we're trying to answer. So John Noonan's answer is yes, the fetus has this personhood. It has a human being with the full rights and privileges of being a member of the moral community. Um, and we'll see more of the significance of that in the next article. But um, Thompson does something that's unusual for a pro-choice philosopher, at least at this point in the debate, is she just grants that the fetus is a person. So he says, she says, for the sake of argument, we'll just say that the fetus is a person. And then Thompson presents us with a test case um, to help us think about our intuitions um, as to whether someone has a right to use your body. So she presents us with this violinist case. So I'm gonna stop share for a moment and just read this passage to you. Okay, so just listen as I read. So she says, imagine this, you wake up in the morning and find yourself back to back in bed with an unconscious violinist, a famous violinist. He has been found to have a fatal kidney ailment, and the Society of Music Lovers has canvassed all the available medical records and found that you alone have the right blood type to help. They have therefore kidnapped you, and last night the violinist's circulatory system was plugged in to yours so that your kidneys can be used to extract poisons from his blood as well as yours. The director of the hospital now tells you Look, we're sorry the Society of Music Lovers did this to you. We would never have permitted it if we had known. But still, they did it, and the violinist is now plugged into you. To unplug you would be to kill him. But never mind, it's only for nine months. By then, he will have recovered from his ailment and can safely be unplugged from you. Is it morally incumbent on you to accede to this situation? In other words, does the violinist have a right to use your body in this case. So let's hop back to the PowerPoint and see what Thompson has to say about this case. Okay. So I'm going to do it. All right. So Thompson thinks the answer to this question is no. The violinist does not have a right to use your body. It would be very good of you to stay hooked up to the violinist. It would be something good to do, but you're not morally required to do it. So it's not murder for you to unplug. So remember from the case, the violinist can only survive if he stays hooked up to you for nine months. So even if you unplug in this case and the violinist dies, it's not murder on your part, according to Thompson. So Thompson thinks the same thing applies in the case of abortion. It would be good of the mother to carry the baby to term, but she's not required to do so, and abortion is not murder in this case. So this argument is just meant to show that someone does not have a right to your body just because she needs it to survive. And so in the case of abortion, the fetus, even though they're a person, does not have a right to the mother's body, even though she needs it, to survive. But then you might wonder, aren't we violating the violinist's right to life? It seems like if the violinist is entitled to life and they need my body to survive, aren't we in some way violating some right that the violinist has against us? Thompson thinks no. The right to life is concerned with the right to be killed unjustly. And so what this means is 
um, if I have a right to life, then that means that I should not be killed for no good reason, or I should not be killed just for the fun of it. Um, and there um, has to be, there can't be this um, overriding reason, um, or there has to be an overriding reason or a greater reason for you um, to kill me in order for you to, to do the deed. And if you don't have a greater reason that justifies my death, you have violated my right in killing me. So what Thompson thinks is that for the pro, the pro-life position to show that abortion is wrong, then the proponent needs to show that abortion is a case of unjust killing. In other words, it needs to show that um, basically we killed the abortion um, for no good reason. The, the fetus had some sort of um, right to the mother's body and then in killing it, killing the fetus, um, we violated the right of the fetus to the mother's body and thus to survival. So in short, we have to establish the right of the fetus to use the mother's body. So then it looks like as far as Thompson argue, Thompson's argument goes so far, um, in cases of rape, it seems that the mother has not given that right to the fetus and abortion seems permissible in the case of rape. But then Thompson wonders about the implications of her argument for other more um, uh, non-rape cases of unwanted pregnancy. So she wonders, well, hasn't the mother's behavior somehow given the fetus a right to her body? So um, she has, she knows the risks that comes along with having sexual intercourse. Um, even though she might still be using contraception, she knows that none of this is completely foolproof. So in knowing the risks, risks and engaging in sexual activity anyways, in some ways she has um, invited the, um, the pregnancy or the fetus into her body. And in that invitation, the fetus somehow gains a right to the use of the mother's body. But Thompson, so Thompson does think that a mother's acting in full view of the risks and consequences of her sexual behavior, even with that protection, can result in a fetus's right to her body. Um, so she does think that for that a good pro-life argument would be something along the lines of um, a dependency argument. And what I mean by a dependency argument is somehow showing that because the fetus is dependent on the mother's body in some significant way, that um, the mother doesn't have the right to terminate the pregnancy. So think about that violinist case. The violinist, he is an independent adult in some way, right? Um, so it seems like there is a, a, a difference between the case of the adult and the, um, the fetus case, right? There's a different kind of dependency going on there. Um, so Thompson thinks that, um, let's see, how would we put this? That, um, part of what could give rise to a, a fetus's right to the mother's body in full view of the fetus being a person is that special kind of dependence between the mother and the child. Uh, and she points out the dependency argument only works if the mother's actions arise from her own free will. So this arg dependency argument wouldn't work in the cases of rape, but in other cases where the mother has engaged in sexual activity, she knows the risks that come from that activity, even with contraception. Um, it seems like she's um, opened herself up to the possibility of pregnancy. Um, and so if she were to become pregnant, it seems like the fetus would have a right to the mother's body. So Thompson's argument basically establishes only that abortion is permissible in some cases and not in others. And this limited permissibility arises because there are cases in which a fetus has a right to the mother's body because of the mother's acceptance of the risk of her actions. So in cases of rape for Thompson, abortion is permissible. 
but in other cases, it's not so clear to see whether abortion is permissible. It depends on the circumstances of the sexual activity and the risks that gave rise to the pregnancy. But Thompson's position would fall into um, more along the lines of the pro-choice um, range of views. So now we move on into Mary Ann Warren's article. Her article was entitled On the Moral and Legal Status of Adoption. So Warren doesn't accept either Noonan or Thompson's arguments. So Warren challenges Thompson's assumption that the fetus is a person. She's going to argue that a fetus is not a person. She also thinks that Noonan's definition of human being is suspect. A being in the moral sense or a member of the moral community is different from being a human in the genetic sense. So Warren thinks that um, we use human being in two different kinds of ways. We call someone a human um, sometimes when we want to refer to that, that human being's status as a person in the moral community. And their status in the moral community, like I said earlier, gives them certain rights. Um, so that's a different sense from being human in the sense of possessing human DNA. Warren thinks that there's a significant difference between these two things, and we're going to see why in a minute. So she calls out Noonan because he fails to show that the genetic um, definition of human being or what it means to have human DNA is not the same as being a human in the moral sense or being a member of the moral community. So then we might wonder, okay, given that those two things, like having human DNA, but being a member of the moral community are different, what is it to be a member of the moral community? So Warren argues that we think that the member of members of the moral community are persons. And when we use that term person, we are implicitly implying that whatever is a person has the following characteristics. They have consciousness, so a kind of like they're awake, they're aware of what's going on around them and internally. They have reasoning ability, so they're able to basically plan, have forethought, um, reason about the choices that they make. They have a kind of self-motivated activity. They're able to um, plan and think about their lives. Um, they would also have, these persons have the ability to communicate. They're able to express themselves and to take in the expressions of others. And they have a kind of possession of a, like a self-concept um, or self-awareness. So they're aware of themselves as a self within this um, community of persons. So Warren argues that to be a member of the moral community or to be a person, one should have at least one of the um, one of these criteria or characteristics um, in order to be in the moral community. So to have rights, the the thing you're calling a person needs to have consciousness or reasoning, or self motivated activity, or the ability to communicate, or have a kind of self consciousness. So Warren argues that a fetus does not have any of the above characteristics. So what she's saying is that the fetus doesn't have any of those things. So a fetus isn't a person and so doesn't have any rights against the moral community. So there's no right to the mother's body. There's no right to life because the fetus doesn't possess the characteristics of a person. We might then wonder, and so does Warren, about the role of potentiality. Remember Noonan's argument. He says there's kind of a, we have more of a probability of surviving at a certain point. So maybe um, we have more of an obligation to someone who has a greater chance of survival. Um, so Warren thinks that there is a kind of role for potentiality, um, but something that um, is a potential human being or a potential person doesn't have the same rights as someone who is actually a person. So while a fetus is a potential person, Warren argues, that status doesn't grant the fetus the same strength of the rights of a full person in the moral community. So basically the rights of a full person outweigh the rights of a potential person. 
So when it comes to abortion, what that means is the rights of the mother always outweigh the right of the fetus. Thus, Warren argues, abortion is permissible in all cases. So she's definitely going to fall into the pro-choice range of positions. Okay, so what do you think? So now that you've had the chance to hear from some philosophers, what do you think of their arguments? So one way to start thinking about this is what do you think about how each philosopher defined personhood? That's a big issue. And it's one of the big issues of abortion. So um, if you're attempting to answer one of the main questions of an issue, we need to ask how strong is your answer to that question in order to get you the conclusion that you wanted. And secondly, what do you think about what it means to have a right to life? How do we define that? And how, how do we even talk about rights? What, what does that look like? So again, we don't want to focus on how do we get the right conclusion to the argument? How do we um, get the answer that we want? But we want to critically examine the assumptions that the philosophers make and see where they land in terms of um, how strong their position is. So just take some time to think about these questions. These are um, important considerations when it comes to the strength of a person's argument. And I look forward to seeing what you have to say in your discussion board for this week.